the next session, session number six, uh, which is for uh, Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Very interesting session. And I am so pleased that I get to chair the final session <laughs> of the conference. That is just fantastic. Thank you, Hanadi. It's been a great conference. So I, I appreciate you. the opportunity. Thank you so much, Professor. Also, thank you so much, Professor Ander Anderson, to chairing several sessions today. <laughs> well, that is perfectly fine. So I'm looking forward to this session. And we have five presenters. Each person will have 10 minutes. And I will ask you to please stick strictly to the 10 minutes because it's going to end at midnight in Kuwait. <laughs> and we know Hanadi is going to be very tired. <laughs> so the first uh, presenter is going to be Grace Sue, and uh, she's co-founder and CEO of, I think it's Warmaloo. Is that the correct pronunciation? Oh, very good. And uh, we're looking forward to it. And I'll give you a two minute warning when you have two minutes left, okay? And the it's yours. You can turn on your mic. Perfect. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Hello, everybody. It's a joy to be here in front of all of you today. Uh, my name is Grace Shaw, and I'm not just the co-founder and CEO of Warmaloo, but I am also an entrepreneurial management and leadership lecturer at the University of Michigan. So I'm just going to share my screen here so you can see it. And um, give me one second. I'm going to open my slides. So I'm going to tell you about, so our creative and innovative approach to, you know, entrepreneurship is actually one that has been, you know, replicated and used throughout the East and the West Coast in entrepreneurial ecosystems. So I'm going to tell you how we took something that was happening on the East and the West Coast and applied it to a university in the middle of the Midwest. <laughs> uh, so quick uh, background on me. Not only am I the co-founder and CEO of Warmaloo, but I've actually been working at the University of Michigan in various roles since 2012. So I started as the youngest senior projects manager within the University of Michigan Economic Growth Institute. That's actually how I got to know this group in the first place is because one of my former directors uh, was working at the Economic Growth Institute at that time. In addition, so uh, I had a chance to, while working on my startup, which originally began as a capstone project, but then I bootstrapped and grew it. So, you know, we ran through clinical trials and prototyping and then growing and now warming 10,000 babies around the globe. Making a medical device company was not easy or building partnerships with Doctors Without Borders or Rotary Club. So we are a $100,000 a year company. And over the course of my career, I've used my expertise from the University of Michigan, managing 200 companies and several multi-million dollar programs, as well as I've had Fortune 50 expertise. So before teaching at the University of Michigan, I had a chance to raise 700,000 in pre-seed investment and manage two to $3 million in vehicle assets for UPS. My goal always, uh, not just as now the you know, co-founder and CEO, we're warming so many babies, um, but I've had the focus on making a positive impact with innovation. So teaching came from a place of, I want to transform and I want to inspire the next generation of student entrepreneurs. In fact, uh, something personal about me is that I uh, actually uh, came from a family of teachers. So my class, um, I'm going to talk about the overview, the course structure and expectations, how we build relationships with cohort members, as well as how we examine the startup basics and the six behaviors, habits, and traits of entrepreneurial leadership. So the University of Michigan, for those of you, you're a global audience and uh, you might not know, the University of Michigan is like the Harvard of the West, uh, well, Midwest, <laughs> and our College of Engineering was founded in 1854. And today it is a multi-billion dollar university. We have a $7 billion endowment 
as well as in the College of Engineering, 90,000 alumni. And the average class of, um, you know, freshmen is, uh, you know, it's, it's um, about, you know, 5,000 students within every graduating class. So within the University of Michigan's engineering department is where we have the Center for Entrepreneurship. This was founded because we recognized, so it was about 10, 11 years ago that the College of Engineering was experiencing so much change, not just a little change, but the whole entire state of Michigan was becoming more entrepreneurial. There were, you know, not just tens of millions, but, you know, billion more than you know hundreds of millions of dollars coming for you know new startups new ventures uh from all across the country so what we thought was how could we better prepare students to create their own companies what are some resources what are some tools and how could we within the university recruit entrepreneurial faculty so something that's very different uh, was with great challenges arise great opportunities. And so um, the Center for Entrepreneurship right away was led by a whole bunch of entrepreneurs, successful business owners within the Michigan and surrounding Southeast Michigan ecosystem. So people who had made million dollar companies that had created battery technologies, who had successfully partnered with you know, automotive companies like GM and Chrysler to make the next big companies. We also tried to tie in. So, you know, the, the co-founders or one of the founders at Google was a former, you know, University of Michigan graduate. How could we tap into that broader ecosystem? So um, the director of product development at Airbnb, many, the director of product uh, solutions and cloud technologies, uh, you know, at Google, the uh, company that got acquired by Cisco for billions of dollars. These companies all came from Michigan. So we created the Entrepreneurs Leadership Program. This gave us a chance to really create a, oh, sorry, um, I will, I don't have the, the email uh, here, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I will, can I, I'll put that together after the 10 minute Q&A. So we created the Entrepreneur's Leadership Program to create this deep, immersed training and mentorship to a group of anywhere from 15 to 25 students to give them functional managerial and leadership skills because you know, these, these students are typically founders in their own right. They've created their own student organizations or they recognize that they want to tackle an entrepreneurial career path. So this, you know, and students realize this because we have this center for entrepreneurship. We have this minor in entrepreneurship. And what we did that was really unique in addition to this immersed sort of cross-functional teaching experience is we also opened up this program to any 20 to 25 students across all of the University of Michigan. So we have uh, graduate students, MBAs, uh, students from the School of Public Health, not just engineers taking our, our you know, immersed entrepreneurs leadership program. And the way this is structured, so uh, sorry that um, pace didn't work perfectly. So the way it's structured is our course runs from uh, January to December we really dig deep with uh, those 20 to 25 students. And so January to April, the winter term, is where we dig into the content. We give them all of the background from accounting to fundraising. How do you raise billions of dollars? How do you, uh, and we bring in guest speakers who have done it before. And then we have an immersed practical section. The summer is where we have those same students go on a tech trek so they go to a different startup ecosystem like boston or san francisco so we'll fly in two minutes okay to stay there and then finally we have a capstone project from september to december all right so that's the structure and we work in the class to cover four key concepts know yourself know your team know the market terrain and the tools and the format is show discuss do so we have entrepreneurs leading startup classes. We also have co-instructors, myself, uh, not, not just me, but my co-instructor has run several companies as a serial entrepreneur. And then we also have case simulations. It's so important because a number of these students 
they, you know, they've had the, often they've led their own companies, but they haven't had that serial entrepreneurship experience. So we give them the chance to run Harvard Business Publishing simulations where they're in the shoes of the entrepreneur. And then last but not least, we give them that immersed, they have a paid internship. So uh, the last part that is really game changing for our program is each student starts a company in that fall term. So they have a capstone project and we've had companies try to create a, a genetics testing company with success and companies, students who are making companies that are B2B as well as B2C. So companies that are doing logistics or uh, one of our students made a company that was providing uh, third party deliveries. So they went from zero to $60,000 in sales within four months. And we really focus on, you know, giving them all the tools, making all the slides available. You can see how broad the classes are. It's not just let's talk about team, but it's the brass tacks. During class, we give them examples of real term sheets and deals and partnership agreements. We bring in real lawyers to talk about intellectual property development. And last but not least, but we create a, a community. So something that uh, is- You've already gone oh, over. Go Okay, that's okay. So that's it. So thank you so much, Professor Beverly. Uh, so that is our Entrepreneur's Leadership Program in a nutshell. And it takes about five to six, you know, Center for Entrepreneurship, University of Michigan staff to run this program, but it's been very successful. All right. Thanks. Beverly, you need to unmute. Professor Beverly. Trent is next, and Trent is the Managing Director of Spirit and the Game Foundation, and this is his second presentation today, and Trent, I'm going to turn it over to you very quickly. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, happy to be back here. Um, and yeah, just sharing a little bit about our work, Spirit of the Game Foundation. Uh, so spiritofthegame.org is the website. I'll also share my contact uh, details after I'm done uh, talking. But uh, let's see if I can uh, get my uh, screen sharing on and <clears throat> talk about what we call creative impact. So uh, we're not just a, uh, an NGO. We're also an impact coaching coalition and consulting consulting coalition that uh, spans the globe, uh, works with entrepreneurs, with uh, corporations, SMEs, pretty much all sizes of companies. And <clears throat> this is a little bit more about our organization. As I mentioned, we have an international network of NGOs. We have the uh, coaching coalition. We also have an impact network that brings together people from different areas of work and as well as a social movement based around the world's first crowdsourced life philosophy. I won't go too much into that because I know the time is uh, limited. This is really what we mean by creative impact. If you think about sustainability equaling do less harm, impact meaning do more good, creative impact is really the art of doing more good without just spending more money. So it really heavily focuses on ideation, creativity, and utilizing the halo effect of the individual and of the uh, company so how they can use their uh, network in order to have a, a greater positive impact, again, without just spending more money. Another way of explaining this uses the leadership versus management uh, analogy of management generally means doing things the right way. Leadership means you're doing the right things in the first place. Right now, there's a lot of focus on ESG, the climate, all of these different uh, areas. And a lot of the thinking right now is on making sure that you're doing things the right way. <clears throat> Whereas there's the not as much focus being uh, spent on the social impact platforms in terms of actually doing the right things in the first place. So the most common um, example that we use here is say you have a store that uh, the sisters, uh, or, or sorry, the, the owner's uh, sister gets cancer. They decide to uh, make that uh, store a fundraiser for cancer. It's great, it's better than nothing. There's a personal connection there. They can uh, leverage that, get their customers involved. But if it's a furniture store, that really has nothing to do with cancer. So that same store, if they were focused on something like sustainable tree farming, that's something they can get their competitors to uh, engage in. It's something they can get their entire ecosystem 
to engage in, and it also has personal residence with their uh, customers. So uh, again, time is limited, so I can't get too far uh, into that, but that's really what we're uh, looking at is working with um, individuals and, and companies that want to increase their social impact platform, want to basically have a greater positive impact on society without just spending more money on that. And that uh, you know, includes the elements of ideation, but not just from within the company. We believe that some of your best ideas are gonna come from your external stakeholders. They're gonna come from your suppliers, from your customers, from your investors, from your employees, obviously, but also you know, from maybe from, from media, people that have watched your company and have always thought, oh, it would be great if they did that. If you can tap into that type of extended network, you're gonna get a much broader range of ideas and then where we are uniquely positioned is we can take a raw idea that you might never have no ability to act on on your own. And, and as a result, you never have. We filter that through our global network. And odds are, however crazy that idea is, we can find somebody in the world who's already done it. They can provide you with a template on how to move forward with that. They can, you know, or if not, we add that to the, our playbook and we put that out in our newsletter saying, hey, we're looking for anybody who's worked on any idea similar to this. And very quickly, we can put together a, a team of like-minded people who are also trying to go in that same direction. But then it's all about kind of bringing this back within the, uh, the company, regardless of the size of that company, and essentially teaching the business brain how to rewire itself. So that first thought in the morning is not what crisis you have to deal with, not how can we make more money, but it's how can we use everything we've done up until this point, all of our ideas in our network to have a greater positive impact on the world around us. And once that clicks in your brain and, and that's the way that you're thinking, it opens up tons of new doors and you have the opportunity not just to change the course of your business, but the course of your industry, because we also work with marketing, inbound marketing, advertising, and a lot of writing, creative writing type of things of teaching you how you can take whatever you're best at in this space and promote that as a competitive advantage to gain more customers and better suppliers and better uh, customers, but also not just stopping there. We never wanted to stop with one company. Our goal is to influence entire industries so that they can all go ahead and take that step because there's a lot of industries that aren't doing things better simply because nobody's gone first. Nobody has pushed that envelope and said, this is the way we all should be doing it. And if we all do it, okay, then, then there's no uh, disadvantage. There's no money being lost. It's a level playing field. It's just changing the new standards of behavior that are acceptable within that industry. And once you get to that point, now you can go faster and faster and every business on earth can start to become a positive contributor to society and we can all start to address a lot of these issues that up till now we've been leaving to the nonprofits to clean up the mess of the uh, for-profit world. It, it doesn't work. It's nonsense. We all need to get engaged. We all need to get involved and use our networks and our creativity to move forward. And that's the way that we're going to find the solutions to these societal issues which have been plaguing us for decades, centuries, or even millennia. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen without broad coalitions. It's not going to happen without an overall change in the way that we all think about business and how it should be uh, interacting with the world around us. There's a few more slides here, but I know that my uh, time is almost up. So I'll go ahead and uh, wrap with that. And like I said, I'll be happy to put our website and my uh, personal contact information in the chat uh, after that. Well, thank you. You even had a minute left. I would have been <laughs> let you have the last minute. But I think this is this is a really interesting company with all sorts of things, and hopefully we have some time for it in the round table. The next speaker is Nakia, who is an, uh, the entrepreneur in residence at Georgia Institute of Technology. I didn't know there were entrepreneurs in residence at Georgia Institute of Technology. Are you here? Where, where are you? Do I see you? My goodness. Nakia? Nakia? Do you know what? Apparently, Nakia. 
is not here. Anadi? Well, do you know, Mohammed? are you here? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I was going to suggest since um, Nakia is not here, <laughs> we will go ahead and have you and then maybe we can have longer time that uh, Grace can add a little things that she would like to add and uh, we will <laughs> continue on. So Mohammed, uh, I would like to, you're an independent consultant, so go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, can I share my screen, please? Of course you may. All right. Nakia wasn't here, Hanadi. He is with me chatting, prepare himself, I don't know. I will call. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. All right, okay, briefly, assalamu alaikum. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hanadi, for inviting me. And uh, I am an, uh, originally from Algeria, based in San Diego, beautiful San Diego, California for some time. And my uh, talk um, today will be on the role of the university in entrepreneurial ecosystem. I think through all of the presentations, uh, we learn a lot about ecosystems, we learn a lot about innovation, we learn about technology and so forth and so on. I don't want to really, um, I really, Kind of like because of time, reduce my presentation and make it very, very simple. Hopefully, I will uh, meet the time limit. Um, so, uh, my presentation really uh, uh, is based on I think we hear a lot, a, a lot of time and almost on daily basis about ecosystem startups, entrepreneurship, and sometimes it's, go back, it's nice to go back to basic and define certain concepts. So I am going to start with a definition um, that is from the entrepreneur May, uh, May 16, uh, 2099. And uh, uh, as you have it here, I don't want to repeat myself, it's here, people can read it. But basically, um, if we use this definition and uh, the model that I'm developing here, and uh, the model that I have here is really uh, based on Dan Eisenberg um, model, which was extensively developed in, the, in a study by the World Economic Forum and the OECD. And I can um, put at the end of my presentation uh, the reference uh, to the extensive report. So basically what we have, we have pillars eight pillars that uh, Dan Isenberg identify as really vital to the ecosystems, they are here. And I will go one by one very quickly about these models um, because of time constraints. So on the next uh, slides, um, we have markets, we have a human capital, funding, support system, uh, government um, regulations, education and training, and uh, uh, major universities and, and culture. And then at my conclusion of my presentation, I will try to explain why uh, the university is play a major role as a catalyst of the ecosystem, because you need a player, you need an institution that kind of connect all of these uh, different uh, pillars together. Uh, so I will not go uh, in details about accessible market. You have domestic and foreign, I think you have it there. Then uh, human capital forces. Uh, funding, I think everybody knows about what is involved in funding. Uh, the support systems for entrepreneurial de development are listed here. And uh, regulations and government interventions. Um, all of this, all of this are really explained in details in, in that report. If somebody wants to refer to it, um, it's really an extensive work with a lot of information, a lot of useful uh, data and information that uh, anybody can uh, uh, use. Uh, so my, my Next slide is really, uh, what is the role of the university um, in the growth? And in my mind, and I always promote that, uh, maybe I'm biased, 
that uh, I really see the university really is a catalyst of the ecosystem for several reasons. Um, they promote the, um, the role and culture of entrepreneurship. Um, they have they play a major role in the idea of formation of new co co companies. And also, you know, they provide a qualified uh, uh, hires. Uh, all of this uh, will lead me to probably my last slides here that I'm sharing with you. Um, I am going to skip about uh, culture. I think you know about that uh, and what culture plays in the uh, uh, supporting entrepreneurship. Uh, so, The university is an academic institution, and that has been, I think, demonstrated by the role of uh, Silicon Valley. And I'm sure that all of you know that Silicon Valley would not have been possible without uh, uh, Stanford and, and Berkeley playing a major role, as well as on the uh, East Coast with uh, Boston and uh, Harvard and MIT building the ecosystem on the East Coast. So, the university, what they do is they, they link, they play a link between different institutions. And that, I think it's vital. Um, I'm, I do a lot of work and research uh, in, um, uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, I always see that uh, many initiative, uh, many uh, projects in the area of ecosystem development are coming up every day, but I don't see really a, a connector. I don't see really a major link that kind of uh, make sure that the ecosystem is uh, is one, is not uh, fragmented. So that's the reason why I think university play a major role, because also they are autonomous and dependent and, uh, uh, and, 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 and they attract minds, they attract uh, 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 brain. So you have, you have, you have that, that uh, factor and also with the free, free thinking, uh, creative culture for uh, business and ideas to germinate and, and, and always um, uh, they build new skills like um, people who are talking about AI, about uh, all kinds of technology uh, and you have new programs, new master's degrees, and new uh, uh, classes on all of this technology, uh, 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 what can I say, academic programs that are uh, needed. So um, I hope that I uh, met with my 10 minutes. Uh, we, can, we can't hear you, Beverly. That, that is fine. Is I, I just turned it off because you had still a minute to go. I was going to let you go another minute. So I, will I, will, I will give it to you with pleasure. No, that <laughs> is perfectly fine. So I try to turn my sound off during when people are doing their presentations. Did Nakia come? Is Nakia here? No, you can proceed. Um, okay, uh, then George, Saturday. that's fine. Then we will go to George. And uh, George is a director of ORCA. And where are you, George? George? There he is. You need, you need to unmute yourself, George. I hope you can see me and hear me. Hello, good. Yes. Hello, good morning, yeah. or good afternoon, or hello to everybody. I hope everybody's in yeah. good health. Um, very, very quickly, just moving on. I've, I've only got 10 minutes myself. Uh, I do have a, a quick presentation, but basically uh, I'm going to put up some slides and just whiz through them if that's okay. So if I may share my screen, if that's okay. Yes. yes. Lovely, thank you. I'll be two seconds. <clears throat> Uh, lovely. Right. Uh, that should be hopefully now coming on to the screen. Here we go. No. Um, is that there? Through? There. Yes. Uh, excuse me, Beverly. Just I need to alert Trent uh, to, uh, yes, Trent, if you put your, the camera in your face because our photographical <laughs> taking a photo for all the presenter for the social media. Thank See you. You. Uh, yes, you, need, yes. you need to get the camera up higher so we can see your face. 
<laughs> is, that, is that better? Much better. Thank you very, very much. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So can everybody see my slide, Five Steps to Achieving Digital Health Integration? Wonderful. Well, ORCA is the organization for the review of care and health applications. We actually review all the care and health applications throughout the, the world. And we have been doing so for, for six years now. We are working with organizations around the world, 14 different countries, including, of course, we are talking to uh, the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi. We are talking to the Ministry of, of Health in Saudi Arabia. I have just signed up the Osteopathic Health Center in Dubai, and I'm also talking and have been talking to the Ministry of Health and Prevention in Dubai as well. So we basically are the organization which is the gold standard for all health and care app reviews. And we effectively um, do five things to achieve through the organizations we work with, digital health integration. The problem is that there are so many applications that people at this moment in time are aware of. There are 375,000 health and care apps on the market, of which only 20% are decent, are good. The other 80% are either bad or extremely dangerous. There are applications which tell people that the, you can find out your blood sugars and also other specifics if you place your finger on the screen. And there are applications which are calling themselves suicide prevention applications, which tell people the quickest and the best ways of killing themselves. So in effect, what we actually have is we have the ability of looking through all the actual uh, applications themselves and reviewing them to see whether they are worth their salt, whether they are good, whether they are actually um, meet all the standards, the guidelines in a number of different areas. Now, if you look at how many uh, downloads of applications there are each day, there are approximately 5 million downloads of health and care applications every single day. And because of that, there is a lot of money being pumped into the growth of apps, especially now that COVID has in fact had the pandemic itself. Approximately $14 billion. So that's a, that's a, a very, very large number indeed. Now, what we have is we have a number of health professionals, approximately 93% of our health professionals saying that the use of health and care applications can improve health within uh, patients and the population with self-management of their conditions. Whether that's something as simple as um, health and well-being for obesity, or whether that's something to do with diabetes, mental health, stress, anxiety, depression, and so on and so on. So what we do is we look at the reasons why it is a good idea for us to go through and promote the best and the safest health and care apps. Now, the problem is people do not know these apps exist. And Google and Apple basically have or are business engines. So they don't always portray the best applications to the end user. So we ensure that the first step to digital integration is to ensure that we know and we present which apps are the best, which ones and which solutions are good. And we look at all the health and care applications against all data privacy, data security, clinical awareness, clinical assurance, clinical efficacy, all your user experience, med medical device regulations, and also, of course, your functions and features. So we cover every single aspect of every single application. We've also spoken to the likes of Fitbit, for example, and we've recommended where they can improve their applications to actually become a, a better app for the actual patient or for the end user. And in fact, their application has in fact grown from 52% uh, over, just over a year ago to 82% as it stands here and now. So we look at all the frameworks around the world. Of course, there's NICE in the United Kingdom, there is the medical health devices regulation, of course, as well. There's the ISO standard standards that we adhere to. There's the DTAC standards now that we also adhere to. There's the DIGA in Germany. There's the M Health Belgium Validation Pyramid, the Nordic Baseline Review, and others all over the world. And we ensure that we put together the best 
applications for national accreditation. So when, for example, um, Canada comes to us and says, we want our own application accreditation library, we ensure that's not only all the actual standards and qualities and guidelines are in place, but we add to those based on the actual requirements of Canada or any other country for that matter. So the second step is once you have looked at all your applications to find which ones are the best, you then have to tell people how to find the best applications. And we put together these libraries for all different types of organizations, whether they are hospitals, whether they are different GP practices, whether they are individual local authorities, whether they are, for example, universities, for example, whether they are organizations where the HR departments are looking after their own staff, or whether, for example, they are ministries or departments of health, for example. We are also, for example, working with the Ministry of uh, the actual uh, Mental Health Commission in Canada. And we have actually taken on board the, all the requirements within Canada for their own accreditation library. So as you can see, we look for every organization and produce for them their own look and feel specific library. And that's the second element of ensuring that digital integration is in your own lo local, local organizations. But then this, the third step is to ensure that not only your clinicians or your social prescribers or your librarians or your alumni or, for example, your student body or your HR department are using the library to the best of its ability to recommend the best applications to the entire population. So this could be the recommendation of an app for MSK, pain relief migraine headaches, a learning or breeding techniques, or any other condition across 380 conditions and subconditions. We have, for example, consultants and general practitioners referring applications as prescriptions for applications to the patients. We have social prescribers referring the best applications to citizens within uh, the population. And we even have HR recommending the best applications to their own um, actual members of staff for occupational health. So before they come back to work, they recommend applications where they use the actual application to make them better before returning to work, for example. The fourth element, obviously, with regards to the actual uh, digital integration is ensuring that your pro account users, your recommenders, all have their own dashboards. And those dashboards will incorporate the Digital Health Academy that we have in place. So we will present to you all the health papers, the white papers, the webinars, and all the academy material for our master's degrees and our PhD doctorates as well. You will see in your own dashboard, your favorite applications that you recommend to your users, and you will also see which recommendations have been sent to who, and if they have been downloaded by the end user or not. And then finally, the fourth and fifth integration steps are integrating patient pathways with the trigger points of where to recommend the best apps to the patient, the patient's siblings, the patient's parents, the patient's grandparents, and the patient's carer. So we know exactly when to recommend the best applications and the safest applications for all conditions to the patient and everybody who has access to that patient's life. And finally, of course, as you will see as time progresses, we also maintain economic sustainability. So for example, with regards to you recommending apps to an end user, some apps of course cost 99 cents or 99 pence, or for example, uh, possibly one, 150 UAD or whatever the case may be. But with regards to the actual economic sustainability, we can help each organization by buying licenses upfront for the application and sending the recommendation to the end user with a code which gives that application to the end user free of charge for 12 months. And we are doing that all over the world with regards to how we are presenting the recommended, recommended apps free of charge to those end users. 
Now, the final thing I would say is that obviously COVID has been a horrible and terrible pandemic, but we have found that by just having the COVID pandemic, the session, session that has been looked at by our end users has grown, has increased by 180%. So people coming onto your libraries, whether it's for a university or whether it's for an organization or whether it's for a health service has increased by 180%. Page views from people looking at those libraries and then simply looking at different pages for different uh, conditions has increased by 66%. Downloads of applications has increased by 182%. But of course, the biggest figure on there is because people no longer want to go to emergency departments or uh, consultant surgery, for example, we have seen recommendations of health and care applications increase by 6,500%. And that simply is saying to you here and now, that as the digital paradigm was moving along up to now, it's now absolutely exploded. And from this point onwards, everybody now is using digital healthcare to manage their own conditions. We are, as Orca, all over the world. We are have, you uh, about winding up? Yes, just what I said now. Yep, finishing off. Thank you very much, Beverly. Thank you. We are all over the world. As you can see here, we have 4,000 professionals on the platform. 12,000 health assessments and 500 plus individual assessment components covering all the standards and guidelines. Basically, we have delivered every single size of organization for charities right through to large global, global, global employment agencies. And finally, of course, we are a multi-award winning business, as you will see from the actual list you see on the screen here and now. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your time today, for listening to my presentation. I hope it has been clear. I hope I have made the actual presentation um, easy for you to follow. And I'd like to thank, obviously, Beverly. And also, of course, I'd also like to thank um, everybody else with regards to uh, allowing me to do this presentation tonight as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, we have some time. We have two presenters talked about uh, universities involved in entrepreneur uh, education. And I'd like to comment that just last week, the Wall Street Journal had big series of articles of the pros and cons of universities or college education for entrepreneurs. I would like to get your reactions to that. Uh, by the way, would you, uh, Moha, uh, there. Thank you. Who is, yes. who is going to go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can give a quick hot take. Uh, so, you know, Professor Beverly and audience, you know, when it comes to rankings, right, a lot of it, you can't really teach entrepreneurship in the classroom often, no, 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 you know, it's very hard. And so I think, you know, I can see where people criticize it. Uh, but what you can do is give students the foundations and also tools that often uh, before universities start teaching entrepreneurship or you know federal programs like the National Science Foundation, they teach entrepreneurial tools like the business model canvas. And so I think that what's great is that you're giving um, exposure. And then instead of having to be in the past, people who were serial entrepreneurs would make like 10 companies. Oh, uh, Dr. Hanadi, I think you're uh, unmuted. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So uh, what is really helpful is that now more than ever, a lot of universities have frameworks and tools to give first time student entrepreneurs the chance to have tools that normally would have taken people 15, 20, nine or 10 startups to, to learn and to use. Okay, Mohammed, okay. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to give your take. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, uh, I am anti-ranking, that's my position, it's always been that way. And I always remember in my, my 70s when I was taking, uh, when I was doing my MBA and this nice, very good business professor, we discussed that topic one day and his question was, how can you rank education? What are the criteria? And I always ask a question when I see ranking and I don't see the answer. I have been asking that question forever. So that being said, I am really a supporter and a fervent of uh, 
uh, the university being a catalyst of the ecosystem. Besides the education, university is a link and the driver and the connector and me, making sure that all of these players, just like a soccer team or a basketball team, they play at the same level. So if you don't have that, you cannot really build an efficient and robust ecosystem. And that's the message I like to repeat. I like to repeat it every time I have a chance to speak. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to... Uh... Ask George, I think the idea that about George's presentation is very good, but the question is, I, are people going to believe it? Here in the US, I believe we have something like 57% are the only have gotten the vaccine uh, yes. for COVID. I think it's something somewhere along in that. Many people would prefer to use snake oil <laughs> to try to treat it. <laughs> whether it be alcohol or something else, uh, rather than going with the accepted things. I was wondering your reaction to that. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Beverly. And, and I have to say one thing as well with, with regards to that. Believe it or not, there are, uh, there are applications on the market today which tell you lies with regards to how you should treat yourself or manage your conditions. There are applications on the market today which tell you whether you have HIV by putting your thumb on the screen. And there are applications to say, uh, for example, we can treat uh, COVID or look at specific um, diseases by looking at individual areas of this application. That's absolutely untrue. And what we want to do is make sure that only the best and safest applications are available for people to look at and to use. So we always recommend that there is obviously, first and foremost, the treatment that's required. So whether that's vaccination or whatever the case may be, but self-management of a condition will only be handled by the best and safest applications. Otherwise, it is not worth using them at all. That's very good. And with Trent, my feeling is your organization, which is an NGO, is trying to help firms do good by doing well and doing well by doing good. So therefore it's not necessarily the, just social responsibility, but they can use their social and social responsibility actions in a way that helps the firm. Is yeah, that correct? Yeah, I mean, we're actually approaching this from all angles as well. For us, CSR doesn't just mean corporate social responsibility. It also means community social responsibility to support the businesses that are doing uh, business the right way. Because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that's going to move the needle on the major corporations and try to change that. You have a lot of this impact investing that pretends that they can influence behavior by threatening to withhold some funding. They just get that funding elsewhere. But if you actually get conscious consumers who are in engaged in this and are paying attention and are giving that feedback to the company, you create the positive feedback loop. So for everybody just in the audience, it doesn't, it's not enough just to vote with your pocketbook. Also give your feedback to the companies because A, they love hearing it. If they don't hear it, they think nobody cares and nobody's paying attention. So it creates a negative feedback loop that they're putting in this energy and not getting it. And the more that you encourage this, the more they're going to be able to move forward and say to their stakeholders, hey, this is the feedback we're getting. People love this. Yeah, maybe our sales uh, numbers are only ticking up a little bit so far, but our positive comments are off the charts since we instituted this type of program. So we all as individuals need to get involved in that process. And just real quick, I know you probably want to jump to the next regarding universities and entrepreneurs we see young entrepreneurs as being the ones who are most receptive to these concepts and we're definitely in favor of a blended approach of university education and entrepreneurial learning you can't just get it just one place and the best scenario that we've come across recently is somebody that went and got a, a, do a doctor's degree specifically because he needed that to be taken seriously in his ngo work and he's doing amazing work with malaria all over Africa. There's just so many examples of people that are able to take the best from both worlds and move forward. And yeah, so we're a big fan of the, the university element if it's handled right. 
Well, thank you. thank you. I think these were wonderful presentations. I'm sorry that we missed one. Um, and I'm going to leave the last word for Hanani. But, uh, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. I wanted uh, to say next year I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. This is will be held held uh, annually. Um, uh, one conference for the international as an international conference, and the second conference we do it most probably in mid of the year for the GCC. And, and the GCC, it's only concerning about our uh, opportunity and challenges in the GCC because we are one family and one region and one area. And this uh, conference, and we leave the second conference. Next conference, I invite all of you in 15 to 17 November. It will be next year, the third conference of um, uh, innovation ecosystem and uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And we invite you from today. And if you accept my invitation, just push your presentation from now, <laughs> if you're able to do it. Now we need this time to taking a photo, our photographical waiting and the technical support company. It's sitting with me in my home, just to securing this conference uh, moving uh, smoothly without any problem. And thanks God, we don't have any problems in our conference. Uh, each person removing the glasses and smile for the camera. <laughs> our photographical will take, go, go ahead, please start. Uh, Everybody in uh, in the room, please a smile for the camera. Yes, okay. Into so right. Thank you so much all of you. And uh, I think, uh, Beverly, you can closing uh, this conference. I think David, David is there. Tom, uh, Professor Tom is there. We need to say uh, hi and bye. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> hi, hi. <laughs> Professor, Professor Tom. Thank you so much for your participation, supporting. I know you are from the earlier stage from today. Uh, listening for all the participants, Professor Amin from the UK. This is one of the top inventors in the UK. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Amin. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Iskirehi from the Saudi Arabian. He joined us. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, George. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Professor uh, uh, Anderson. Uh, all of you. Uh, David, 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 can you say anything? Well, as I said in my session, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to be in a company in company with such an um, extraordinary um, range of speakers from all over the world. Uh, as I said, I don't know anyone who's been able to collect a group like this. So I'm sure I, I speak on behalf of everyone when I say we will be looking forward to next year. Oh, uh, Professor Tom, Professor Tom, one word. Well, he said he said it wonderfully. Yeah, I look forward to the next one. You. It never ceases to amaze me how many great, great people you get to come together uh, for three days. It's remarkable that you keep doing this. I know, and I know how much hard work it is and how much you stress over it. So, Greg, congratulations. No problem. But at the end of the end of the day or the end of the destination, we success in this conference and everybody is comfortable and getting knowledge and sharing uh, uh, knowledge and experience and doing a great networking. Professor Amin, last word. Uh, thanks very much indeed. I really enjoyed the conference uh, over the past days. Uh, very informative, very enjoyable. Met the great uh, people online and we hope to keep in touch with them and hopefully develop further collaboration. So thanks very much, Dr. Hanadi, for this great work. Yourself and your team were great and excellent organization. So thanks uh, very much indeed. Thank, thank you, Professor. I mean, Trent, Trent, last word for you. Trent. Yes, thanks for having Thank me. Thank you uh, for supporting us. Thank you. And you're doing two presentations. And uh, we're concluding with you. Last word for our conference. 
hey, together we can all do more, but it all starts uh, with us individually of taking that next step and standing up and speaking proudly about the work we do to encourage others to do the same. So thank you all and uh, go for it. Thank forth. you. Grace, go ahead, pushing some words. Thank you so much, everyone. It's a joy to see uh, the world connecting, even during the pandemic, to really focus on entrepreneurship and innovation. It's inspiring and wonderful to see so many great people convene together today. Thank you, Dr. Hanadi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone want to push last word before we're closing out still? Uh, we yes, have five minutes remaining. Yes, if I can. Yes, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Uh, go I'm ahead, Mohammed. That's I hope not next year if you will remember me. Okay. ممكن تكلم بالعربي؟ ايه تكلم بالعربي. Okay. شكرا على الفرصة هذه للمحاضرات وشكرا على كل ال 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 يعني اللقاء وإن شاء الله اللقاء يكون يعني فيها في فائدة للمستقبل فائدة للسنة الجاية إن شاء الله. Now for our friend who will probably not speak Arabic like I do. Uh, I would like to thank all of you being here. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful for all of us to really uh, talk about entrepreneurship, innovation, technology, um, helping the youth for a better future all over the world. And I think that is our major contribution. And thanks again and hope to see you next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hanadi. Thank, thank you. See you all next year. See you all next year. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.